uh, have lots and lots of collaborators around the world. These are the uh, people who uh, contributed mostly to the uh, conclusions that I'll be drawing, but there's a lot, many, many other people who have been involved <coughs> in doing the, making the observations. Now, blazers, of course, are, are very famous for having the apparent superluminal motion. Uh, sometimes you get a little discouraged when you look at, at uh, images, one image after another, and you see lots of changes happening, and it's not clear what's coherent. So you, you have to return to a, a source that's doing something obvious once in a while to convince yourself that, uh, that things are really, really uh, actually fairly well behaved overall. Here's 3C279 over many years, over several years, and you can just see the uh, jet just growing, growing, growing. And uh, it, it grows at a rate which sometimes is around five times the speed of light and sometimes as high as 20 times the speed of light. And we think that the, the main difference is probably just the angle line of sight, the jet kind of twists around uh, in the sky a little bit. Uh, it's probably changing by only, only a couple degrees in its actual pointing. In projection, it looks like a lot more. And these changes in direction, it, 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 the Lorentz vector may or may not be variable, but uh, all of the variability that we see in the, uh, in the apparent motions can be just due to changes in the jet direction. Uh, in some cases, like via lack, it looks like there may be precession that causes these changes. But in most of the cases that I've seen, it's, it's kind of abrupt. That the gel will be pointing one direction for a while, then suddenly it'll switch to another direction. So it doesn't look like precession. It looks more like some kind of instability that's going on, or maybe that only little, some fraction of the jet uh, cross sections is actually lit up at any given time, and that fraction, that that uh, the side of the jet gets lit up changes. The fastest blazar jets that we've seen uh, exceed 50 C. Uh, Matt Lister has one that he's pursuing, I don't remember the name of it, but he has one that he thinks may be going 70 C, a preliminary result. Uh, this is a well-known uh, BLAC object, 0235 plus 164, and uh, it, it's hard to, to get these motions that are that fast because they, 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 they not disappear pretty quickly. Uh, you can do better with the polarization than if you just try to do total intensity. And this one looks like it's going about 56 C. Um, and uh, in PKS 5010-089, we've seen something going about 45C. So somewhere around 50C or so is, is around the, the fastest speeds that we see in blazars. You know, slower than what are inferred for gamma ray bursts, but still, you know, not, not orders and orders of magnitude less. One interesting thing is that the, uh, which is a clue as to how the, the jets are, um, are focused and accelerated, is that we found by a, a doing very detailed studies to get both the angle line of sight and the Lorentz factor from the apparent motions and from the time scale of, for decline of the flux uh, of a given, given knot in the jet, uh, we found that the opening angle of the jet, the intrinsic opening angle of the jet, is inversely proportional to the Lorentz factor. Uh, that explains why uh, one of the, one of the, the uh, puzzling things in BLBI has always been why when you're looking at a jet like 3C279, you think it's pointing almost right at you. Why doesn't it have a really, really broad opening angle in the sky? And the answer is because it's intrinsically really, really narrow. Uh, and, and so even though it's pointing almost at you, its intrinsic narrowness uh, still makes it appear relatively well collimated on the sky. Uh, this agrees with models uh, uh, like the Vlahakis and Kunigl model where you have acceleration over a, uh, a quite an extended range of distance from the central engine. Uh, and so the, the jet is fairly slowly focused, and in the case of blazars, it gets focused out to parsecs, uh, out to the parsec scales before it's, it's finally accelerated to supplement Lorentz factor and, and completely focused. What is the proportionality factor? Um, you find in the George Standard All paper, it's of order unity. Uh, I, I don't remember the, the exact number. Yeah. Anyways, if you look at the George Standard paper in astronomical journal, what's C saying? What's that? C. Point one, point three. Oh, here it is, yes. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, yeah, this is, uh, yeah, about 0 0.5, I guess. Somewhere, somewhere in the 0 0.5, 0 0.6 region, somewhere in there. Okay, now, the, the VLBA images uh, that, we, that we see, that when we look at the, the VLBI and VLBA images, we see a compact uh, uh, feature at one end. It's probably quasi-stationary, maybe even, even completely stationary. That's what we call the core. So this thing at one end of the jet. We can sometimes see things a little bit upstream of the core, but in general it's the thing that's, that's most upstream, the most compact thing that we can see in the image. And then the question is, what, what is it? Uh, the, the standard explanation from the uh, old Blanford and Kunigold papers 
is that it's a tau equal one surface where the jet at any given frequency becomes optically fixed so you can't see any deeper and so that's why you have a bright stationary point it's 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 a just a place where the flow becomes optically thick and so as you go to higher frequencies you should be able to see deeper and deeper into the jet but what we found that that may be the case for some objects in other objects we find that that it's, it seems to actually be a physical feature downstream of this tau equal one surface and the most likely explanation of what the physical feature is is some kind of standing shock, probably in the shape of a cone, uh, because if you have a, a transverse standing shock, then you're going to slow down the flow too much, and it won't be optimistic anymore. And you see that in the numerical simulations uh, that people have done of jets. Okay, here's a, a, a short movie made by Craig Walker from uh, something like seven epics of VLBA images of M87. And M87 you know, is well known to have a, what appears to be a fairly slow flow with some hints that maybe some superluminal motion. Uh, Craig says that the independent people watching this tend to see outflow in this thing. So sometimes if you get really good time resolution, you, you can see things that, uh, that appear to be outflow. And uh, it's, it's mildly superluminal. This is showing that the flow is not that well collimated here. Now, M87 is not pointing right at us. It's pointing at an angle somewhere around 30 degrees. So, uh, so you see that the flow isn't very well collimated. And here, the black hole, of course, is very massive, three or four billion solar masses. And it's a, quite a nearby galaxy. And so the resolution we get with VLBI uh, at 43 gigahertz is something like uh, 100 or even a little bit less than 100 uh, Schwarzschild radii. So you're looking very deep here, and it looks like very deep in the jet isn't all that collimated. Now, it's not clear whether you're seeing the same wreath of the jet we see in blazars or not, or if you're seeing some kind of uh, sheath around that jet, some slower <laughs> sheath, it's not clear. Okay. One of the, uh, the projects that we carried out over a number of years, and you really have to be patient with, with these objects because you have to get, to get years of data in order to accumulate enough to understand what's going on, are two radio galaxies, 3C120, which is an FR1 galaxy, and 3C111, which is an FR2 galaxy, both have superluminal motion of around five times the speed of light at radio wavelengths, so the blazar is at radio wavelengths, but then when you go to optical and x-ray, the radiation comes from the central engine. The optical radiation uh, uh, comes from the accretion disk, and the uh, x-ray radiation, we think, comes from a corona around the accretion disk has an iron line and so an iron emission line and everything. So it has all the characteristics uh, in both these objects that most of the X-ray radiation comes from the central engine. So when we're looking at, at the X-ray variability, we're looking at the variability near the central engine. And when we're looking at the uh, radio you know, superluminal motion and the radio variability, of course, we're looking out in the jet. And the question is, you know, how are they related? And how far is the core of the jet that we see on the VLBA images? How far away is it from the central engine? We had an old result that we published in Nature in 2002, where we saw four dips in the X-ray emission in 3C120, followed by a couple months, followed by a, a bright superluminal mass moving down the jet with strongly polarized, looking like it may be shock waves or something like that. And so when, then we observed it to death. We observed it from 2002 until 2007. Had lots of ejections, lots of X-ray dips. And uh, good enough to do a correlation, so we took the, uh, the uh, Metzahovi 37 gigahertz light curve and did a, a correlation analysis with the X-rays and found an anti-correlation, which is what you expect if uh, superluminal knots make radio outbursts, which they usually do. And, uh, and these X-ray dips, of course, are negative flux events. And so we saw a, uh, an anti-correlation between the uh, 37 gigahertz flux and the X-ray flux. So uh, it's an objective uh, way of, of saying that there is this this connection that when you have a drop in the X-ray flux in the accretion disk corona region, you then get something shot down the jet, some energy shot down the jet that makes a shock wave or some other kind of knot that then moves down the jet superluminally uh, in, in our uh, reference frame. at something like 0.98 C in, in its reference frame. How do you actually know that the X-rays are not coming from the jet? Because uh, you have a strong iron emission line. You don't get a strong iron emission line from, from a jet, you know, so it's all non-thermal. There's also a very strong uh, X-ray optical correlation uh, with close to zero time lag most of the time, but sometimes the optical lags by quite a bit. Uh, and so that's why we think the optical also comes from the accretion disk. 
3C111, the FR2 radio galaxy, more powerful than 3C120, does a very similar sort of thing. Actually, it's a little bit more obvious. The knots that are produced are even brighter than the core when, the, when they first start coming out. And the X-ray dips are, are quite, uh, most pretty spectacular X-ray dips. In this case, some of the X-ray emission sometimes comes from the jet, because when we see a, a big millimeter outburst, you sometimes see a spike in the, uh, the X-ray emission as well. You can see a couple cases. There, but not very often. There are certainly some uh, red arrows there that don't seem to correspond to those. Uh, well, we, we miss four, we miss eight weeks in the sun. So, so, so there's sometimes where you see some, some clue here that there may be a dip, but you really, but you can't see it. Um, so, it, it, what we, you know, when we have a, a really deep dip like this, you see a really, really bright thing coming out a, a couple months later. And uh, here you see an extended dip, um, and there that was an extended set of knots, series of knots that came out. So it looks like a pretty good, pretty good. 3C120 is the one where we have more statistics, and so we have a uh, you know, kind of stronger objective case for a correlation. But uh, this one having a really strong thing coming out after the last big dip looks pretty good. We can do a, a power spectral density of the X-ray variability because we have enough data accumulated now from the RCE satellite. And we can compare it to uh, the microquasars like Cygnus X1, which is the, the one that has the best determined <coughs> PSD, um, and uh, or one of the best determined PSDs, and, and Seifert galaxies. Uh, McCarty et al. have found that for Seifert galaxies, the, uh, the uh, PSD of the variability in X-rays looks quite similar to that of Cygnus X1. You don't see the, uh, the turnover in the spectrum at the low frequencies just because you don't have uh, long enough data train to do that. Uh, so, and we see the same thing in 3C120 3C111, pretty much the same as C for galaxy, same PSD, uh, with a break, break, uh, time scale of the break is proportional to the mass of the black hole. So it all fits together very nicely. Uh, and, and so uh, in the case of Seiferts, the conclusion was that, uh, that Seiferts are in the high soft state similar to uh, the high soft state of, of uh, Cygnus X1. And they don't have, of course, strong relativistic jets, so that makes a lot of sense. In the case of 3C120 and 3C111, they have very strong relativistic jets, so what are they doing in the high soft state? You know, my conclusion is they're probably living right near the transition between the intermediate and the high soft states. And so maybe that, that's uh, because you, know, you see things getting shot down the jet all the time, as you do with microquasars, but the jet doesn't go away as it does when a microquasar is in the high soft state. So it may be somewhere around the transition, but it, it could just be that, that uh, when you scale things up by that, that much in mass, that some of, the, uh, some of the physics changes a little bit. For example, the cooling time scale uh, is something that doesn't scale with the mass of the black hole. So uh, there, there could be a, some subtle changes that, uh, that change this, this mechanism. But nevertheless, we have drops in the X-ray flux corresponding to, to things getting shot down the jet. It's just more subtle than in, in uh, GRS 1915 plus 105. Okay, now switching to blazars, uh, BL LAC is an object that uh, that we can observe uh, uh, quite well because it's it's a strong emitter at all the wave bands. Uh, we did a campaign in late 2005 where we observed BL LAC and, and uh, several other blazars for 10 nights intensively, and we happened to hit it uh, just right when there is a, uh, a beautiful uh, optical and x-ray outburst. Actually, it ended up being a double outburst. After the campaign, we, we continued to observe it uh, a little bit less frequently. And we saw a, a double uh, optical flare. There's also double x-ray flare. It's not so x-ray data are a little bit radier. But here's the second x-ray flare. Here's the first. The TVs, as uh, you know, Robert Wagner was saying this morning, that the TV <laughs> detection occurred then. A TV error bar, because you don't get that many photons, TV error bars, uh, you can't really say it was an outburst in TV, but it's kind of suspected that it was probably an outburst at that time. But there wasn't anything in the radio that occurred during, for that, uh, during that first uh, flare. What did occur was a rotation in the optical polarization vector. It rotated by 240 degrees. Uh, 240 degrees is just more than one full, uh, more than, uh, than half a cycle. You can, get, you can get half a cycle of, of rotation of polarization from things like aberration, changing aberration angle as, as a knot uh, changes its, its direction or changes its, its uh, Lorentz factor. 
But to get more than 180 degrees uh, actually requires either physical rotation or just some stochastic process like turbulence. But the rotation is too smooth to be explained by turbulence. We have too many data points to, uh, for that explanation to be viable. So it really looks like that something was actually uh, rotating around. Uh, that there, there's some, something that's sampling the magnetic field that's, uh, that's going around in different directions. We had uh, VLBA images uh, during this period, uh, as we always do. We monitor now about 30 objects uh, every month with a VLBA at 43 gigahertz. And here you see uh, the core, which is presumed to be stationary. And starting a little bit upstream of the core and then moving through it is a feature that has a polarization, which is about 20 degrees. The polarization direction is about 20 degrees inclined to that of the core, so we can differentiate it from the core. And as it passed through the core, there's a big outburst. <clears throat> and then it, it proceeded downstream at a apparent speed of 5c. It ends up at this time when there was this big outburst that we see in the VLBA image in the core, and that was the same time as the second flare was observed in x-rays and in optical. And that's when a, a major radio outburst started as well. How is the core defined? What's that? How do you decide where core is? Uh, you, you find it by the polarization. Here you can't, can't see so well because it's... So you have to use you know, this knot here to identify it. But you see that the polarization of the core is uh, essentially vertical on this, on this diagram, polarization direction. So the model that we, uh, we concocted for this, actually this is not, not our model. This was predicted by Nectarius Vlahakis, one of the, uh, the MHD uh, simulators. Uh, he, he predicted that we would see these polarization rotations. It was kind of a bold prediction because you can imagine reasons why you wouldn't see it. For example, if you're not covering the entire jet, then even if you have a helical magnetic field that is collimating and accelerating the flow, uh, if you have a knot that covers the whole thing, then symmetry is going to essentially cancel out most of the polarization. Uh, so if we have a, an emission feature that doesn't quite cover the entire jet and it spirals around, uh, through the helical field or spirals around on the helical field lines, then uh, you can get this apparent rotation of the, uh, of the polarization as it cycles around. And so our, uh, our model for the flare is that as the jet accelerated, as the feature accelerated down the jet, it got a higher Lorentz factor and that's why you have the first flare. And then it gets in, it gets in the region here beyond the helical field where the magnetic field is more turbulent. Uh, it, this thing turns into a shock wave as it goes through the turbulent field, but it spreads out, and so it's not so bright until it gets compressed by the standing shock wave that lies at the core. So we have an outburst caused by the thing accelerating, and then you have a second outburst caused by, uh, caused by having it being compressed in the core region. So that's a model that uh, came up with that that's uh, consistent with the data. This is, uh, I just reiterating things, some details, so I'll skip that. So the locations of the flares that we have are in two places. And these are, this includes X-ray flares. So this is high energy flares as well as synchrotron flares occurred in two places in the jet, here and here. I think that that's one of the reasons why there's been some confusion in the literature. Our group has been, complaining, has been claiming, along with the, uh, the Finnish group, has been claiming that gamma ray uh, flares in blazars occur in the core or downstream of the core. Whereas theorists tend to like to have things occur here because that's where you have more seed photons, uh, deeper, you know, closer to the central engine, and it appears that both groups are probably right part of the time and wrong part of the time. Uh, so, so there's at least two places where you see the, uh, the outburst occurring. We see a similar sort of thing in the Quasar 3C279 where we, uh, like in, in, uh, where we have uh, about a dozen years of X-ray observations with RCE. Uh, very good sampling, and of course radio and, and optical observations and so on. And we see that, that the, here the uh, green dots are x-rays and the red uh, triangles here are uh, optical R-band, and then the red is, or the uh, black is radio 37 gigahertz. And you find that some of the flares you have essentially simultaneous x-ray and optical, and others you have a time delay. Uh, and, and in some cases, you have the uh, the X-rays are substantial; they have a substantial amount of, 
of the optical energy output. That's the energy output of the optical X-ray at comparable. In other cases, uh, the optical has a lot more of the energy output. And so uh, the conclusion there again is, and also with the time delays between the uh, flares and the superluminal knots uh, appearing downstream, we conclude that X-ray and optical flares occur in two places again, well upstream of the core and right around or a little bit downstream of the core. This is in the Chatterjee et al. paper that was published in AFJ last December. Now continuing on to 2008-2009 where Fermi is now uh, able to observe the gamma rays, we find uh, in 3C279, uh, oops, we find in 3C279 a uh, gamma ray outburst near the end of the year that corresponded very nicely with an X-ray outburst. The gamma ray outburst died faster than the X-rays, which makes sense because X-rays are made by some lower energy electrons than gamma rays are. The outburst going up as well, but it's not as well sampled because it was just coming out from, from being close to the sun. So it's, but it was certainly a lot higher. The outburst was certainly a lot higher than it was earlier. So that's a little taste of, of what uh, Fermi can give us. Uh, here's a bigger taste. The uh, Bialak object 0235 plus 164 I showed before. Oops. Keep pushing it backwards instead of the uh, instead of the laser pointer. Uh, so, so you see, it's not coming out. Well, the birth date of that knot was right at the time of a uh, major optical flare, which occurred also near the peak of the uh, of the gamma ray uh, flare. And there's a second gamma ray flare <coughs> where you also have an optical peak, and that was it, probably when this thing was born. There's another knot coming out that was born a, a little bit later, of course, and that seems to have been around the same time. We have to have a little bit of faith that had about the same speed as this previous one in order to get the birth date down. So that's a little bit more uncertain. So there's some pretty good correspondence between the appearance of a superluminal knot and, uh, and a gamma ray outburst and, a, and an optical outburst in this case. 5010 minus 089 is the object, though, that uh, we have the best observations because it's, been, it's had a number of outbursts seen by Fermi in the gamma ray. And uh, we have a very good time coverage of the, uh, the, uh, of the uh, flux at all the sorts of different wave bands and, and also some BLBI observations. So this is uh, what it's been doing since Fermi's been alive, since Fermi's been operating. There's a nice outburst in the autumn outburst right around the beginning of this year, and then the springtime it just went crazy. It had a couple months of, of outburst activity. Now it seems to have died down a bit. So th those are the data from Fermi. Uh, an optical, it had such a huge outburst last month, or actually now it's June now, so in, in April, and it had such a huge outburst in April that the scale of this diagram makes this outburst it had during the uh, gamma ray outburst to be, look like it's a little nothing. It did have a little, little optical outburst here that uh, actually preceded the gamma ray outburst. Uh, and, and unfortunately the scale makes it look like it's, it's not there. But the x-rays are essentially dead. They're bouncing around a little bit, but they, the x-rays aren't really, uh, are really at a, quite a low level. Meanwhile, there, there was a big radio outburst in the summer of 2008 that was just slowly dying down when, uh, when this big gamma ray uh, outburst occurred. And then there was a, uh, I don't know yet about the, uh, about the centimeter uh, radio, but at 230 gigahertz there's a big outburst, factor six outburst, that peaked at the same time as this gamma ray peak here. So lots of uh, lots of multi-wave band connections here, but for some reason the X-rays aren't playing a role, which which has me really perplexed. I'll mention that again later. Well, what is the spectrum in front of Spectrum. You don't get a, a spectrum out of Fermi yet. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, they, they, uh, they, they there's you can get some hardness ratios, but they're really not. We intentionally not apply hardness ratios because of the parallels, not generally. Yeah, I'm, I'm taking just public data here that, that they produce publicly, and, and they don't have that information yet. And, you know, we'll try to get it when, when there's more available. So if you take a look at, uh, well, if you take take a look at uh, at the individual outbursts, you see first there's an optical flare here, and you can just barely see little bumps, and then the, then the gamma rays, and then the X-rays follow the, the gamma rays. Of course, there's a bigger X-ray outburst before them, but uh, but the X-rays may may be just doing their own thing. They may not be related because later on you see a, a nice gamma ray outburst here. You really don't see much in the optical. A little blip a little bit later. So maybe there's a delayed optical flare. 
Nothing in the x-ray. Actually, the x-rays went down a little bit there. And, uh, and it doesn't look like there's much going on in the, in the radio at that time either. Then the springtime, you get another one of these. You have a nice gamma ray peak. It's essentially the same time as an optical peak. The x-rays went up, but they, they, they're still you know, just, just oscillating on a really low level. Next one here, there's an optical peak here. Really not much going on the gamma ray, but maybe a little bit earlier in the gamma ray. While the uh, millimeter is going up. Here's, here's a nice peak in the gamma ray, and the optical is dead. The x ray is, maybe the x ray is starting to, to come to life a little bit, but not much. And that's where you get the peak at, 30, at, at uh, 230 gigahertz. And then finally, here you have the, the, the biggest optical outburst that's happened in, you know, in, in decades in this object. And it coincides with a, with a gamma ray peak, but the gamma ray peak is short lived and not, as, not nearly as striking as the optical peak. So the, you know, there are correlations here, but the, they're different for every flare. So it's a little bit, uh, a little bit odd. See, this is a, a superluminal ejection. And you can see easily with, with the polarization helping you out that occurred from last summer. It's, it's uh, that knot moved at around 20 times the speed of light, which is nearly as fast as, as this object can go. And probably, it, it looks like that, that there's going to be a new knot that, that was produced. The core region got brighter, so it's probably a new knot passing through it uh, in early April. The really surprising uh, thing, actually maybe not surprising, it to be a lack result, is that during the springtime outburst, the optical polarization rotated by 4 pi. You can just follow, it. since there's, there's the 180 degree ambiguity, you can just follow this uh, continuously. This goes right up to here and just follow it continuously uh, over 4 pi uh, radians. And at the end of it, at the end of this rotation is when you had this big optical outburst. Actually, I had to cut off this optical outburst so, so you could see some of the other stuff a little bit better. So this optical outburst actually goes up to 20 uh, milligasses. So focusing on this rotation of the polarization, uh, the first cycle, oops, this, this first cycle was two and a half times slower than the second cycle. So it looks like that the knot is accelerating down the jet. Uh, what should happen is that the mate is that the helix should open up. The helix of the magnetic field should open up down the jet as the uh, toroidal magnetic field is com uh, energy is converted into uh, bulk kinetic flow energy. Uh, and so it should it should be that the, the helix of the magnetic field is winding up instead it should really wind down. And so this uh, is, is probably a good. Uh, it, it matches pretty well with the idea that the. A jet is accelerating through this helical magnetic field, called the acceleration caused by the helical magnetic field opening up and changing toroidal field energy into, uh, into bulk flow energy. And we can model it crudely as, as a blob that's, or some kind of, some kind of uh, disturbance that's propagating along the helical field lines. And uh, if we take an angle line of sight of 0 0.4 degrees, which matches the uh, Lorentz factor of 40, which we derived from our previous DLVA observations, uh, and the apparent speed last the uh, autumn of the of the knot is about 20 c. Uh, and if we say, okay, at the beginning of the rotation here, which is some, would be somewhere around here in this cartoon, so at the beginning of the rotation, the line stretch was around 20, and at the end it was around 40. Okay, mm -hmm. then we can make then then, then all the uh, the uh, the rate at which the uh, polarization rotated and so on can all be explained by that that the sort of uh, cartoon model. Then eventually you hit, hit some turbulence, and then it goes through the core. And when it goes through the core, that's when you get this final optical outburst right, at the, right after the rotation ends. So this where the optical polarization peaks is right around the time of the big optical outburst. And why not an exact course but an abundance between gamma ray and lower frequency flares? Um, well, the optical synchrotron radiation depends, of course, on the magnetic field and on N0. It also can depend somewhat on the direction of the magnetic field, but that would be more relevant if the polarization were really, really high. Uh, whereas the inverse Compton depends on N0, the, uh, the number of electrons that you have, and on the seed photon field. Now, in one day, when you, when you figure this thing is moving so fast, in one day, 
a blob in the jet of 1510 mass 9 moves by more than one parsec. So moving by more than one parsec, the seed, if there's, there's sources of seed photons in the area, it's going to pass by them very quickly. And so you can have some very quick outbursts in gamma rays that you wouldn't see in the optical because uh, the optical radiation doesn't care about uh, you know, if, if it passes by some uh, young supernova remnant or something like that where it picks up, uh, picks up photons. Uh, so, that, so if the number of external seed photons changes well, when you get a gamma ray flare, then this could, uh, this could get, give a gamma ray flare without a synchrotron flare. Really mysterious thing for me is why are the X-rays inactive while all the other wave bands are in outburst? Because the X-ray, the the, energy, the electrons that make the X-rays should be the same that are making the uh, 230 gigahertz uh, synchrotron radiation. So how come they're not? The, they're only doing this little wiggling around instead of having a major outburst during this period. That's that's really uh, really a mystery. And finally, in the X-ray, you see the X-ray has been active the entire time we've been observing it with RCD until now. And now, just as, as the gamma rays are going crazy, the X-rays are playing dead. So uh, here, since we're out of time, you can, you can read the conclusion yourself. It's just uh, basically a summary of what I've been saying. Thank you very much. Uh, you showed the picture for Bill Lux light curve there, uh, you, and the radio clearly was peaking like uh, two months after the gamma ray uh, flare, the first flare. The, yeah, yeah, the, the, what the, do you make the, out of that? How, yeah, the, how far is the radio emitting region? Yeah, well, the, well, the radio upper started during that second flare, and the second flare is when the knot was passing through the core. So you associate this second flare not with the first gamma ray flare, but with the second gamma ray. Uh, flare. But it's the same disturbance. That, that is a, that. Yeah, the, but this the, is your interpretation. The, well, of course, yes. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> but 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 it's, but, it, but it's substantiated by the optical rotation during the first flare, the rotation of the optical polarization during the first flare. Yeah, but I mean, how do you know that the radio is not is not, for example, associated with the first uh, flare? Not. Well, we we can see the knot that, that produces the radio. We actually see in the VLBI, we actually see, and we see see the outburst, the radio outburst occur as the knot passes through the core. So so having the combination of, of the of VLBI images, sequence of VLBI images, along with the multi wave band variability and polarization variability, allows us to tell the story, and, and, it's, and it's a very nice, consistent story. If you had any less information, you, you would be confused and, and just guess. And I mean, if I can just put in a, my, my two cents, it, probably what you really want to do is observe a single source like BLAC and see several similar events and see the same pattern in all of them. And then you, can, you get some confidence that that interpretation is right. It's a little bit, a bit I mean, it's what we have to live with. It's a little bit well, eventually we may get it. You know. yeah. Uh, so when you uh, had this picture with um, with your uh, idea of what is going on in the uh, image with the so, so, um, rotation of the polarization, uh, do you th really think about the Alaska helical magnetic field on this case? I'm asking because this is very often said that the you cannot have that much of the polarizer component on the large case because then the magnetic flux is too high to use what you can You can't have much poloidal? I mean, when you, you have a, a huge magnetic flux, right, associated with this helical magnetic field. Yeah. So can you support it? You know, that's the question. Well, well the, I mean, the, the, the magnetic flux is going down uh, you know, with distance because it's being converted into, into the bulk, bulk flow. So, so it's, it should be an echo partition. Not the energy flux, sir. Magnetic flux. Yes. Magnetic flux. So uh, it has it has it sounds the area, right? Because yeah, I mean, it should, it, should, it should be an echo partition here. Uh, yeah. uh, I mean, if, if this is this is something I, I don't really quite understand this argument. But in fact, the field has to close someplace, right? So I mean, you could have a poloidal flux going out, <coughs> say, in the inner part of the jet, and returning, say, in an outer part of the jet. Uh, yeah, sure, it, it closes and, somewhere. You know, all this would be happening in the inner part. Yeah, yeah it's uh, it's closing somewhere. But the point is that if there is too much of the poloidal component on this scale, then the flux of so intensity times the cross section area is. Much, uh, very, very high when you just say that well, you can support close to the black hole. Oh, oh, oh when, you, when you come back down here. Yes. Uh, so, like, what would, what, what would be the intensity of the magnetic field close to the black hole that this model implies? That yeah, I haven't calculated that. Yeah. And, uh, related question. So, what is actually the length scale, uh, the wavelength uh, of the uh, helix? Uh, the wavelength uh, of the helix in the model. Can you estimate it? Yeah, well, the, the, the inference. At, at the place in, in, in uh, 1510 minus 9 that we're looking at, the inference is that it's, it's uh, 10, 20 parsecs or something like that. Because, because it's a very fast jet. It's a very fast jet. And so so this, this region here has to be way downstream just because it, 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 
it, it traverses more than a parsec per day. Uh, and, and, and this rotation occurred over a two month period. So it, it's, it's, way, it's, it's way downstream, tens of parsecs downstream. Tens of parsecs. Tens of parsecs downstream. You don't have any choice. If you're going to accelerate something up to the Lorentz factor 40 in one, of these, in, in one of these objects, right? You have to do it over a fairly extended period in this sort of I mean, I mean, the wavelength of the helix. Yeah. The wavelength of the helix yes. is, is yeah. 10, 10, 20, 30 parsecs, something like that. <laughs> 10, 30 parsecs. Yeah. At, at, at this, at this stage, here, here, of course, it's going to be a lot, lot more squashed up. So if you have but, a but here rotating black hole, for example, so what would be the anticipated wavelength? Well, I only did that for, for be a lac, uh, I did it, and, and it worked out okay. That, that is that, that the, the, if you anchored it near the black hole, you can anchor it somewhere uh, either in the ergosphere or out to, say, 20 gravitational radii. And, and the, uh, the winding of the field, the, the, the rotation of the field lines at the foot point would be what, what you... Yeah, what you get. You, for for VLAC, it is. VLAC is a lot smaller than this. This is a lot bigger than VLAC. From the, uh, from the big rotational measure that you have, you heard that there was true physical motion uh, rotating, right? Can you have an estimation of, uh, of the rotational speed? Um, I, I did that again for, for VLAC. It was, uh, it was you know, some fraction of the speed of light. But you know, substantial, substantial fraction of the speed of light, but not at the speed of light. And when you talk about Lorentz factor, it's Lorentz factor associated to, so, poloidal uh, velocity or poloidal velocity? Yeah, 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 the poloidal, poloidal velocity. Yeah. Okay, Alan, can you, can you just explain, with the, in your helix there that you've got, yeah. it's getting, um, the pitch angle is decreasing more now. Yeah. What's actually causing Well, that, that's, that's because of the conversion of the toroidal magnetic field into, uh, in, into ball kinetic. I'm doing that. I'm just doing that. Well, that, that's that's a magnetic acceleration model because there's a magnetic pressure gradient that's that's driving things out, and there's a conversion from the pointing flux into the, uh, the into the okay, kinetic so flow. It's basically because the flow is accelerating. Yeah, that's right. That, that's these these, these MHD models for for column based accelerating the flow uh, convert the toroidal magnetic field into flow energy. I'm sorry. Uh, when I hear the word "not," should I think shock or not always? Well, not always. Uh, the only way that you could have a, a shock propagate through this thing is if it actually followed the field lines. And I, I think it's, uh, was it a fast magnetic shock? Maybe a sonic shock can do that, but a slow one can't, I think, or something like that. So, so, so not, you were saying that at some point it passes through a shock, right? Yeah, it, out here it turns into a shock, yeah. When, when it gets in, into the turbulent field, then, then I, I think it turns into a shock. Because the, the polarization characteristics, uh, at least for BLAC, the polarization characteristics were what you expect to have a, a, a transverse, a, a shock that's transverse to the jet axis moving through a turbulent region. But does it not have accelerated particles, or is it just a compression of whatever is there? <coughs> does it accelerate particles actually? It probably accelerates particles. <laughs> and you, have to, you, have to, you mean this, this thing here? It has particles. Whether it accelerated them or picked them up, you can't can't really tell. I mean, there really isn't isn't a good model for what this what this thing is, right? Before it, before it comes out of this region. Out here, uh, at least for a lot of objects, it looks like it, it could be a shock. Other objects, it's, it's not so clear. But but for for a BLAC, it looks like it could be. It's, it's probably a shock out there. And also, so when you get beyond, it's also a little bit unclear when you see a knot in a map. Is it necessarily a shock? Or yeah. Where yeah. is the deviation occurring? Uh, in here. So so you need to produce the deviation. Yes, yes. Or at least at least 0 0.1 TV. It depends on the Lorentz factor. But yeah. So, so you, you, I mean, the, the impression that you have is that it does accelerate particles. Did you have a question? Yes, I was wondering. The, the, so the way you interpret the knot then would be some blob of electrons which is associated with particular flux of particular tube of field lines that is moving? Yeah, I mean, you know, because, because you have, you know, you have the, the, the helical, vehicle field is actually, it's, it's a combination of, 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 uh, of longitudinal and, uh, and toroidal magnetic field. So, so it's, you know, circulating around right. the whole gangle of, of field lines, yeah. Right, but the, you know, the emission of the knot is, is a bunch of particles which is tied to a certain... Yeah, and, and what, what, I'm saying is, what I'm saying, that's all I can say about it. I don't have any. I don't have any evidence to say anything more than that. Right. But you know, is, 
Is that what you have in your mind when you sort of <laughs> describe these models or something else? I usually have a shock in my mind, <laughs> but, but I don't have any evidence for that here. And, and, and it may violate. Now, the, it, it, it can be a shock if, if, it's, if it's actually following the field lines. If, if, it's, if, if the streamline isn't the same as the field lines, then it can't be a shock because it can't make it through the strong field. Amir, you're, you're pregnant with a question. Uh, can it be, let's say, have you tried the model with a, some boundary layer? You know, you have a shear layer and the field is automated and you're not running through something like that. You mean, you have the, so, 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 so is the polarization clean? Or are you saying it's too clean to be explained? Like I, I think it's, I think it's too clean to be explained by that. And, and, and plus, with with the uh, with, with the uh, with the accelerator and all that stuff. I mean, in in, in the case of, of BLAC with with a Lorentz factor of about five or six, it could be you know something that's not right along the spine. But in fifteen ten minus zero eight nine, where it's, it's got such high Lorentz factor, it's really got to be in the spine. I think in the spine of the really fast spine of the jet. So I, I don't think you can play with it, with the boundary layer in that case. In BLAC, you probably you, you might be able to. It does, it does look like there might be also some sort of wiggling of the angles about the linear behavior. Have you tried to fit that along? No, no I, I haven't tried it. Yeah, just, just doing uh, toy models and then getting back to more observations. Okay, any other questions? Okay, let's thank Ellen again. Thank you. And we'll go on to our last speaker of the, of the day. Elizabeth Lawson, exploring the disk jet interaction in the radio lab chamber between the accretion flow and production of relativistic gas. And we know it's very likely that um, the reason why only a minority of AGN are radio lad and produce these jets has got something to do uh, with the accretion flow. And a very good way of studying the accretion flow in AGN is to use X-ray spectroscopy, which is what I have been doing. So just a very quick reminder of where we think the X-ray emission in AGN comes from. So this is a very schematic view of an AGN. So with the black hole in the middle, um, blue is obviously the disk, and so we assume that's a standard geometrically thin, optically thick disk. Um, the red blob that's above the black hole is meant to symbolise the corona, uh, consisting of hot electrons. And so the emission that we see is uh, some combination of the emission that comes straight from the corona and the emission that is reflected in the disk before it reaches us. So um, the emission from the corona uh, has to come by a law, so the spectrum will look something like that. And um, what's more interesting is the um, emission that's reflected in the disk and the resulting reflection component of the spectrum uh, may look something like this. So this component has got all these strong features and in particular, uh, well, often the most prominent one is the iron um, K line around 6 kV. <coughs> and so if this emission originates in the inner disk, it will be sort of smeared out due to relativistic effects and in particular the iron line will be broadened. And what's nice about that um, or I should say that it is relativistically smooth in this case, as you can see. <laughs> and so what's nice about this spectrum is that, well, at least in theory, it can be used to constrain 
lots of important disk parameters such as the ionization state, the ion abundance, the inclination of the system um, in the radius of the disk. And because the inner, innermost stable orbit of the black hole depends on the spin, it can also be used to constrain the black hole spin. So if you want to compare the accretion flows in objects with and without jets, um, you can compare their reflection features. And when people have done that, it is usually found that the radio loud objects tend to have weaker reflection features and less relativistic broadening than the radio quiet counterparts. And so that can be explained in a number of models. Um, one um, possible explanation is that, oh, sorry, <laughs> shouldn't touch that. <laughs> Uh, is that the jet actually contributes to the X-ray spectrum, so it sort of dilutes the spectrum and makes the reflection appear weaker. It may be that the, the disks in um, the ejected objects are very highly ionized, in which case you wouldn't get the strong features that I showed you in the previous slide. Or the usually favoured interpretation is that um, the standard thin disk is truncated at some radius and replaced by some sort of hot, radiatively inefficient flow, uh, like an ADAF. Um, and that type of flow would then give rise to these reflection features. <coughs> um, and what's nice about this explanation is that it agrees with what we think is going on in the low hard states of X-ray binaries, like we heard about earlier today. Uh, and also we really expect that type of flow at very low accretion rates, below sort of 1% Eddington or so. And it is also observed that um, the radio loud ADN do tend to have low accretion rates. So this plot is showing the radio loudness as a function of the accretion rate in Eddington units. And so I think the, well I know the upper sequence is the finest radio loud and the lower sequence is radio quiet. And I think you can see there's a larger fraction of radio quiet, uh, radio loud objects at low accretion rates. <coughs> so this is suggesting that um, in a lot of these objects uh, we have a situation that looks something like this. So if there's a jet, the thin disk uh, might be truncated or perhaps missing altogether and there's this um, hot flow instead. <coughs> um, the question is whether this <coughs> may um, apply in all um, AGM with jets and whether it may even be um, a condition to form a jet, then together with lots of other things, probably like a black hole spin, a high black hole spin. Um, the arguments against this, obviously, is that we don't expect that type of flow in objects that have uh, somewhat higher accretion rates. And also, X ray spectroscopy has shown a handful of examples where we do see these reflection features and broad lines um, which indicates that the thin disk extends all the way in. So I think these three are probably probably the best examples. Um, we heard about a 3C120 just now. Um, I should say RG is the gravitational radii, uh, radius, so 6RG is the inner most stable orbit for a static black hole and if it's maximally spinning it goes into the 0.24. <coughs> so I should say these are not completely conclusive, um, at least not the lower two, and do need to be confirmed with further observations. Uh, so the object I'm going to talk about is this uh, last one, 4C plus 3426. And this was a salt with the inner radius being less than 6 RG um, was based on a 30 kilosecond XML observation. So in order to see if we could confirm that small radius and also possibly constrain the spin, as you can do if you have a very small inner radius, we obtained um, a longer Susaku observation on this object. So just first of all, to give you uh, just some background on this object. It is a radio light quasar located at about 0.1. Um, it's actually quite a low luminosity quasar and it's got a large one sided jet, as you can see on the image to the right. So the grey is the radio and the green stuff um, are x ray contours. <coughs> it's got quite a large black hole mass, so about 4 times 10 to the 9 solar masses, and 
a very rough estimate of the adding to ratio is about 4%. And how do you do the estimate the mass of the black hole? Um, just based on the black hole mass and the bolometric luminosity. Uh, the, the mass of the black hole, sorry, yeah. <laughs> just the adding to ratio. Um, that was from the um, luminosity of the broadline region radius relation, I think. Uh, it has a reverberation depth uh, later? No. no. Um, so, let's see. For the Suzaku observation, I had an exposure time of about 90 milliseconds. And this here is the light curve in the 0 0.5 to 10 kV range. So you can see it gets brighter during the observation, which is nice. This is the first time we've seen some variability in the source, um, mainly because it hasn't been observed for very long before. Um, Suzaku actually caught it in its highest flux state to date. And well, in addition to this um, excess detector sub low energies, um, this also is detected in the pin detector up to about 30 kV. So if we look at the spectrum in the entire energy range, <coughs> it looks like this. So this is actually a spectrum plotted as function, um, as a ratio to your model for the power law continuum. Um, so there are a few features that stand out clearly. Uh, this absorption at low energies, which is sort of roughly the same amount as we've seen in previous observations, and it's not strong enough to expect, uh, affect the spectrum above 2 kV. <coughs> and because when I did this analysis, there were some calibration problems at low energies, so I'm only going to focus on the spectrum above 2 kV from now on. And so at the higher energies, we see there's a couple of strong reflection features. There's the dependent ion line around 6 kV. And there's also an excess at high energies that's presumably due to the quantum reflection hump. So if we fit this model, um, the spectrum, with a model like I described before, consisting of the power law uh, and a reflection component, the best fit I get is the following. So we have the data fitted with the model to the left. And um, the model components to the right. So the black line, um, which you can hardly separate from the red line, is the shape of the model, the red line is the power law, and the blue line is the reflection component. And I listed some of the best fitting parameters below. <coughs> uh, the values within brackets are the 90% confidence limits. So a few things to note. Uh, first of all, the best fitting inner radius, oh, pressing that again. <laughs> It's about um, 70 rotational radii, and it's not very well constrained, which is they're not supporting the previous X and M results. Um, we have an neutral disk with an eye of about two. And but very often in these objects, we see um, a narrow component of the line, of the iron line, that's thought to originate from distant matter, such as the, the torus. Uh, in this case, it seems like that component is, is weak and is not required <coughs> in the fit. So, um, because the previous XMM results suggested such a small inner radius, I also wanted to check whether such a model could describe this data. So I have refitted the data with the inner disk radius fixed at 1.24 RG. And if I do that, I get the following fit. So in order for this fit to be acceptable, I do need to include uh, a narrow component of the iron line. Uh, this is the blue one here. <coughs> The only other thing that changes, yeah, sorry, five minutes. I minutes. <laughs> uh, the only other thing that changes uh, with the smaller inner radius is the inclination, um, which goes up. But apart from that, you can see this is actually an acceptable fit. If you look at the, the fit statistic, it's not very much worse um, than the previous one. Although the residuals, especially around the iron line region, um, they do look nicer in the previous, <coughs> previous part. So I would, I would favour the previous model, but a scenario like this cannot be completely done that. Which is illustrating a very common problem with fitting these models. Um, is that they are quite, uh, the parameters are hard to constrain unless you have very high quality data. Let's see what's next. <coughs> I, I just also wanted to share a comparison with the XMM <coughs> observation. So again, uh, so black is XMM and red is Suzaki. And uh, so again, both spectra are shown as a ratio to a power law. And you can see the iron line profiles actually look fairly similar. 
and if I fit a joint model to the data, I find I can actually find a good description if I have exactly the same reflection component for both uh, observations. And the, that best joint fit has an energy square radius of about 160 gravitational radii. So again, this is not, not supporting <coughs> emission from the very inner disk. But what's interesting about this is that um, that fit will then indicate that the, the increase in flux in between the two observations um, can be mainly explained by a power law that has increased in normalization and become slightly steeper, but that's not necessarily reflected in the disk, which may suggest there's some sort of beaming and that at least part of the power law is associated with um, the jet. If we do have a jet contribution to the spectrum, it means that the power law that we've been measuring in these fits is actually a combination of two power laws. Um, a one, probably a hard one, associated with the jet, and a steeper one that would be associated with the typical corona. And it would only be the latter one that's reflected in the disk. <coughs> I tried constraining those models, uh, but I find that unfortunately um, this data that was not possible. And in particular, to constrain uh, jet contribution, you do need to look at higher energies. Um, but so to possibly find out a bit more about this possible jet contribution, we can have a look at the variability properties of the Susaku data. So this is just the spectral hardness plotted as a function of the cap rate. Uh, the three different colours are just different x size detectors. Each thin cross is a six kilosecond chunk of the observation, and the thick ones uh, is just what I get if I bend the data along the x-axis. So, um, as you can see, there's quite a large spread, and the hardness ratio doesn't actually change by that much. But there is some evidence of spectral um, hardening as the cap rate increases, which is interesting because in most typical radio quiet galaxies, we tend to see the opposite behaviour. And in that case, the emission is only dominated by the typical corona and its reflection in the disk. So this could be consistent with a model where a jet contributes. Um, for example, if the relative contribution of a hard jet increases as the flux um, goes up. And sort of in line with that is the RMS spectrum. So this is just showing the variability amplitude as a function of energy. <coughs> Uh, and as you can see, the variability goes up at least to sort of about 5 kV or so. <coughs> and again, if you compare it with typical radio quiet galaxies, um, they tend to look the other way around. <laughs> so this is, this is the long Susaku observation of MCG6. And so although um, these variability properties of 4C74, uh, they're not proving in any way that there's a jet contribution. Um, what we, can, what we can say, at least, is that um, this object is not um, behaving like a typical radio quiet theta galaxy. Which brings me to my conclusions. So with the Susaku, the longest Susaku observation, um, we find that this, uh, we don't require any emission from inside about 50 gravitational <coughs> radio, which is then not supporting the previous XM results, although we can't rule out completely relax the small inner radius and um, just discuss the variability it may indicate uh, a jet contribution and I think I've demonstrated that in order to constrain these models we need very very long observations with current telescopes and well finally I just want to point out that the fact that we don't see a broad line or strong reflection features from the inner disk obviously doesn't necessarily imply that it's missing um, in fact there are lots of fairly high accretion rate, um, radio quiet, AGN, where um, the reflection is, is modest, and there are lots of other models. Uh, and, and in those objects, we don't um, expect a disk to be truncated. And so there are lots of other models to explore and um, to explain that. Um, and I'm not going to talk about them now because I'm running out of time. But again, with long observations, we can do that. Thank you. I'm sorry, Peter, I missed something. Can you explain again what do you mean by fitting a model? What's a model? What do you mean by by a model? What, what are the parameters? What are the a model for the spectrum. <laughs> I'm not sure what you. <laughs>
Bit. What are the physical ingredients that you put into a model? I mean, what, what? I mean just for the um, coronal emission, just the power law, and for, for the reflection, it's just the emission that you um, expect from so, so an, an optically thick disk. Uh, what uh, had express source? And Illuminating uh, a and disk. The disk uh, yeah. And the disk? Exactly. And the disk and for the emission from the disk itself? Yes. Uh, that is, is the roughly on model, um, that, that's it's the emission from um, an optically thick, geometrically thin disk um, with constant density um, that's illuminated by a hard X-ray spectrum. And then it's relativistically blurred uh, for a very kernel that takes into account uh, all the sort of orbital motion and inclination effects and, and so on. You want the standard, standard models from X-Spec? Yes, yes. So what's the name of that model? Refion. Uh, I understand that keeping effects on Vanilla give us um, uh, uh, constraints on the energy uh, return in X-ray binaries because the disk there emit most in X-rays. But in AGNs, the, the disk at high machinery objects are supposed to be in UV. Yes. So I just don't understand, uh, by keeping X-ray continua, how you can say about the disk, presence of the disk, you just constrain corona. No, no, no. So in, in the X-ray binaries, you get the thermal emission from the, from the disk in the X-ray spectrum, whereas that's in the UV. Um, in the, yes. Yeah, that's completely correct. But what we do see is um, the, this broad iron line, for instance, which is a feature of uh, that's reflection in the disk, and that tells us there's a disk there, and it's the shape of that line <coughs> that can tell us um, where the inner radius is. Yes, still, but you constrain only corona, right? If the, if no, no, you're the iron line. But if, if the iron line is uh, coming nowhere, it's exactly produced. Right? Because, because if you, um, the extent of the red beam on the iron line depends, that's um, a general relativity effect. So if the emission originates very close to the black hole, it, this uh, iron line profile will be very drawn out, and the red, pro, uh, red wing will extend down to sort of 2, 3 kV. Whereas if it extends further out, it will be much smaller. So you just can say that there is no uh, material emitting fluorescent iron line, but not there is no disk. I just don't understand this. You can't say there's no disk, but what you can say if you do see uh, a very very broad iron line, that then you can say the disk must extend all the way, all the way in. So that's the whole point. So, so, the Sorry, fit is, so the fit is basically based on the on the on fitting the iron on the fitting the iron. And, and, well, and that's, it's also the sorry. You have you have the power spectrum, mm -hmm. and on this you, you fit the, the iron the iron line, and see what's the width of the iron line and, and how it fits to the characteristic yeah. effect of the of the of the wide Yeah, but it's uh, the iron line is just a part of the reflection spectrum. You also have this big uh, higher energies, this Compton reflection hump that peaks around 20 or 30 kV or so. And if you've got lower energies, you've got sort of soft excess emission at that, those energies as well. So it's a whole reflection continuum that you're fitting. But true, the most prominent feature that you see uh, in, in sort of 2 to 10 kV spectra is, is that that will be the iron line. I think what you're asking is, is that your results are very sensitive to the way you uh, <coughs> subtract the continuum. I mean, the shape of the line is very sensitive to the to how you exactly subtract the continuum, right? So, so well, the continuum is the power law, and and the rest of the reflection continuum. But this this is this is uh, not a subtle line. This is a really obvious yes, line. Yes, yes. So I mean, there's no question that the line is that. Yeah, <laughs> you, can, you can see it very clearly. I would just like to again uh, in connection with the same question that the uh, profile of the line and its width depends on the emissivity profile of the line. That so yes. it's definitely if your emissivity at the lowest uh, at the closest regions is just declining, mm -hmm. then you will also see some narrow narrower line <coughs> that if you you understand that. Yes, yes, yes. And it, uh, in principle it's not excluded that your innermost regions can be illuminated this way that it will be perfectly ionized to what's, uh, so it, it will not produce a signal exactly. point. Exactly. So it's easy. Uh, you can you can at the same time make a disk go into very innermost uh, regions and do not have reflection at the same time. So that's not a problem. And uh, your emissivity profile is some simple ones. Yeah, I fixed it at minus three because um, that's usually quite a hard parameter constraint unless you've got very high quality data. Well, I have a question. Yes. Could you, could you go back a couple of slides to um, join the um, yeah, this one, this one. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. 
Okay. No, I mean, I'm just wondering, looking at these two things, yeah, um, it actually looks to me like it could be that you've got a peak there. And what we're actually seeing is the different Which objects. Uh, is, well, no, you've got a peak in both of them. Right, right. yeah. And, so and then you're actually seeing the two dominated by different sides of the speaker. There's have got a peak that is sort of shifted along in, um, in energy. Is that a lot of reasonable? Uh, possibly, I'm not sure what type of models would explain that. So, uh, the, the, ex oh, sorry. the explanation for this one is actually that it can either be explained by spectral pivoting of the pile or, or that um, as the flux changes, the reflection component is nearly constant and the pile law is changing in normalization. Does that explain the turnover as well? Uh, or is that which, sort of at low energies? Yeah. Or, yes. Um, okay. Oh, wait, I'm talking about <coughs> this one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. So you mean this, that part? Thank you. Yeah. Um, the model I fitted was just uh, above sort of 1 kV, so I'm not sure about the very lowest energies. So that might be a problem. Any other questions? Okay, let's uh, thank both of our speakers.